This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World in Seventy Two Days by Nellie Bly. Chapter 4 Jules Verne at Home. Monsieur Jules Verne and Madame Verne, accompanied by Mr. R. H. Sherard, a Paris journalist, stood on the platform awaiting our arrival. When I saw them I felt as any other woman would have done under the same circumstances. I wondered if my face was travel-stained, and if my hair was tossed. I thought regretfully, had I been travelling on an American train, I should have been able to make my toilette en route, so that when I stopped off at Amiens and faced the famous novelist and his charming wife, I would have been as trim and tidy as I would had I been receiving them in my own home. There was little time for regret. They were advancing towards us, and in another second I had forgotten my untidiness in the cordial welcome they gave me. Jules Verne's bright eyes beamed on me with interest and kindliness, and Madame Verne greeted me with the cordiality of a cherished friend. There were no stiff formalities to freeze the kindness in all our hearts, but a cordiality expressed with such charming grace that before I had been many minutes in their company they had won my everlasting respect and devotion. Monsieur Verne led the way to the carriages which awaited our coming. Madame Verne walked closely along by my side, glancing occasionally at me with a smile, which said in the language of the eye, the common language of the whole animal world, alike plain to man and beast, I am glad to greet you, and I regret we cannot speak together. Monsieur Verne gracefully helped Madame Verne and myself into a coupé, while he entered a carriage with the two other gentlemen. I felt very awkward at being left alone with Madame Verne, as I was altogether unable to speak to her. Her knowledge of the English language consisted of no, and my French vocabulary consisted of oui, so our conversation was limited to a few apologetic and friendly smiles, interluded with an occasional pressure of the hand. Indeed, Madame Verne is a most charming woman, and even in this awkward position she made everything go most gracefully. It was early evening. As we drove through the streets of Amiens, I got a flying glimpse of bright shops, a pretty park, and numerous nursemaids pushing baby carriages about. When our carriage stopped, I got out and gave my hand to Madame Verne to help her alight. We stood on a wide, smooth pavement before a high stone wall, over the top of which I could see the peaked outlines of the houses. Monsieur Verne was not long behind us. He hurried up to where we were standing and opened a door in the wall. Stepping in, I found myself in a small, smoothly paved courtyard the wall making two sides, and the house forming the square. A large, black, shaggy dog came bounding forward to greet me. He jumped up against me, his soft eyes overflowing with affection, and though I loved dogs, and especially appreciated this one's loving welcome, still I feared that his lavish display of it would undermine my dignity by bringing me to my knees at the very threshold of the home of the famous Frenchman. Monsieur Verne evidently understood my plight, for he spoke shortly to the dog, who, with a pathetic droop of his tail, went off to think it out alone. We went up a flight of marble steps across the tiled floor of a beautiful little conservatory that was not packed with flowers, but was filled with a display just generous enough to allow one to see and appreciate the beauty of the different plants. Madame Verne led the way into a large sitting-room that was dusky with the early shade of a wintry evening. With her own hands she touched a match to the pile of dry wood that lay in the wide open fireplace. Meanwhile, Monsieur Verne urged us to remove our outer wrappings. Before this was done, a bright fire was crackling in the grate, throwing a soft, warm light over the dark room. Madame Verne led me to a chair close by the mantel, and when I was seated she took the chair opposite. Cheered by the warmth, I looked quietly on the scene before me. The room was large, and the hangings and paintings and soft velvet rug, which left visible but a border of polished hardwood, were richly dark. On the mantel, which towered above Madame Verne's head, were some fine pieces of statuary in bronze, and, as the fire gave frequent bright flashes as the flames greedily caught the fresh wood, I could see another bronze piece on a pedestal in the corner. All the chairs artistically upholstered in brocaded silks were luxuriously easy. Beginning at either side of the mantel, 
they were placed in a semicircle around the fire, which was only broken by a little table that held several tall silver candlesticks. A fine white Angora cat came rubbing up against my knee, then seeing its charming mistress on the opposite side, went to her and boldly crawled up in her lap, as if assured of a cordial welcome. Next to me, in this semicircle, sat Mr. Sherard. Monsieur Jules Verne was next to Mr. Sherard. He sat forward on the edge of his chair, his snow-white hair rather long and heavy, was standing up in artistic disorder. His full beard, rivaling his hair in snowiness, hid the lower part of his face and the brilliancy of his bright eyes that were overshadowed with heavy white brows, and the rapidity of his speech and the quick movements of his firm white hands all bespoke energy, life with enthusiasm. The London correspondent sat next to Gilles Verne. With a smile on her soft, rosy lips, Madame Verne sat nursing the cat, which she stroked methodically with a dainty white hand, while her luminous black eyes moved alternately between her husband and myself. She was the most charming figure in that group around the wood fire. Imagine a youthful face with a spotless complexion, crowned with the whitest hair, dressed in smooth, soft folds on top of a dainty head that is most beautifully poised on a pair of plump shoulders. Add to this face pretty red lips that open to disclose a row of lovely teeth, and large, bewitching black eyes, and you have but a faint picture of the beauty of Madame Verne. This day, when she met me, she wore a sealskin jacket and carried a muff, and on her white head was a small black velvet bonnet. On taking her wraps off in the house, I saw she wore a watered silk skirt, laid in side plates in the front, with a full straight black drapery that was very becoming to her short, plump figure. The bodice was of black silk velvet. Madame Verne is, I should judge, not more than five feet two in height. Monsieur Verne is about five feet five. Monsieur Verne spoke in a short, rapid way, and Mr. Sherard, in an attractive, lazy voice, translated what was said for my benefit. "'Has Monsieur Verne ever been to America?' I asked. "'Yes, once,' the answer came translated to me. "'For a few days only, during which time I saw Niagara.' I have always longed to return, but the state of my health prevents my taking any long journeys. I try to keep a knowledge of everything that is going on in America, and greatly appreciate the hundreds of letters I receive yearly from Americans who read my book. There is one man in California who has been writing to me for years. He writes all the news about his family and his home and country as if I were a friend, and yet we have never met. He has urged me to come to America as his guest." I know of nothing I long to do more than see your land from New York to San Francisco. How did you get the idea for your novel, Around the World in Eighty Days? I asked. I got it from a newspaper, was his reply. I took up a copy of Le Siècle one morning, and found in it a discussion and some calculations showing that the journey around the world might be done in eighty days. The idea pleased me. And while thinking it over, it struck me that in their calculations they had not called into account the difference in the meridians, and I thought, what a denouement such a thing would make in a novel, so I went to work to write one. Had it not been for the denouement, I don't think I should have ever written the book. I used to keep a yacht, and then I travelled all over the world studying localities. Then I wrote from actual observation. Now, since my health confines me to my home, I am forced to read up descriptions and geographies. The servant asked me what my line of travel was to be, and I was very happy to speak one thing that he could understand, so I told him. My line of travel is from New York to London, then Calais, Brindisi, Port Said, Ismailia, Suez, Aden, Colombo, Penang, Singapore, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York. Why do you not go to Bombay, as my hero Phileas Fogg did? Monsieur Verne asked. Because I am more anxious to save time than a young widow, I answered. You may save a young widower before you return, Monsieur Verne said with a smile. I smiled with a superior knowledge, as women, fancy free, always will at such insinuations. I looked at the watch on my wrist and saw that my time was getting short. There was only one train that I could take from here to Calais, and if I missed it, I might just as well return to New York by the way I came, for the loss of that train meant one week's delay. 
if Monsieur Verne would not consider it impertinent, I would like to see his study before I go, I said at last. He was only too happy to show it to me, and even as my request was translated, Madame Verne sprang to her feet and lighted one of the tall wax candles. She started with the quick, springy step of a girl to lead the way. Monsieur Verne, who walks with a slight limp, the result of a wound, followed, and we brought up the rear. We went through the conservatory to a small room up through which was a winding stair, or, more properly speaking, a spiral staircase. Madame Verne paused at every curve to light the gas. Up at the top of the house, and along a hall that corresponded in shape to the conservatory below, Monsieur Verne went, Madame Verne stopping to light the gas in the hall. He opened a door that led off the hall, and I stepped inside after him. I was astonished. I had expected, judging from the rest of the house, that M. Verne's study would be a room of ample proportions and richly furnished. I had read so many descriptions of the studies of famous authors, and have dwelt with something akin to envy, our space is so limited and expensive, in New York, on the ample room, the beautiful hand-carved desks filled with costly trinkets, the rare etchings and paintings that covered the walls, the rich hangings, and, I will confess it, I have thought it small wonder that amid such surroundings authors were able to dream fancies that brought them fame. But when I stood in Monsieur Verne's study, I was speechless with surprise. He opened a latticed window, the only window in the room, and Madame Verne, hurrying in after us, lighted the gas jet that was fastened above a low mantel. The room was very small. Even my little den at home was almost as large. It was also very modest and bare. Before the window was a flat-topped desk. The usual letter that accompanies and fills the desks of most literary persons was conspicuously absent, and the waste-basket that is usually filled to overflowing with what one very often considers their most brilliant productions, in this case held but a few little scraps. On the desk was a neat pile of white paper, probably eight by ten in size. It was part of the manuscript of a novel that Monsieur Verne is engaged on at present. I eagerly accepted the manuscript when he handed it to me, and when I looked at the neat penmanship, so neat, in fact, that had I not known it was prose, I should have thought it was the work of a poet, I was more impressed than ever with the extreme tidiness of this French author. In several places he had most effectually blotted out something that he had written, but there was no interlining, which gave me the idea that Monsieur Verne always improved on his work by taking out superfluous things, and never by adding. One bottle of ink and one penholder was all that shared the desk with the manuscript. There was but one chair in the room, and it stood before the desk. The only other piece of furniture was a broad, low couch in the corner, and here, in this room, with these meager surroundings, Jules Verne has written the books that have brought him everlasting fame. I leaned over the desk, and looked out of the little latticed window which he had thrown open. I could see through the desk the spire of a cathedral in the distance, while stretching down beneath me was a park, beyond which was the entrance to a railway tunnel that goes under Monsieur Verne's house, and through which many Americans travel every year on their way to Paris. Leading off from the study is an enormous library. The large room is completely lined with cases from ceiling to floor, and these glass-doored cases are packed with handsomely bound books which must be worth a fortune. While we were examining the wealth of literature that was there before us, Monsieur Verne got an idea. Taking up a candle and asking us to follow, he went out into the hall. Stopping before a large map that hung there, holding up with one hand the candle, he pointed out to us several blue marks. Before his words were translated to me, I understood that on this map he had, with the blue pencil, traced out the course of his hero, Phileas Fogg, before he started him in fiction to travel around the world in eighty days. With the pencil he marked on the map, as we grouped about him, the places where my line of travel differed from that of Phileas Fogg. Our steps lagged as we descended the winding stair again. It had come time to take farewell, and I felt as if I were separating from friends. Down in the room where we had been before, we found wine and biscuit on the little table, and Monsieur Jules Verne explained that, contrary to his regular rules, he intended to take a glass of wine, that we might have the pleasure of drinking together to the success of my strange undertaking. They clinked their glasses with wine, and wished me Godspeed. 
"'If you do it in seventy-nine days, I shall applaud with both hands,' Jules Verne said. And then I knew he doubted the possibility of my doing it in seventy-five, as I had promised. In compliment to me, he endeavored to speak to me in English, and did succeed in saying, as his glass tipped mine, "'Good luck, Nelly Bly!' Madame Verne was not going to be outdone by her gallant husband in showing kindness to me. She told Mr. Sherard that she would like to kiss me good-bye, and when he translated her kind request, he added that it was a great honor in France for a woman to ask to kiss a stranger. I was little used to such formalities, or familiarities as one may deem them, but still I had not one thought of refusing such delicate attention, so I gave her my hand and inclined my head, for I am taller than she, and she kissed me gently and affectionately on either cheek. Then she put up her pretty face for me to kiss. I stifled a strong inclination to kiss her on the lips, they were so sweet and red, and show her how we do it in America. My mischievousness often plays havoc with my dignity, but for once I was able to restrain myself, and kissed her softly after her own fashion. With uncovered heads, and despite our protestations, they followed us out into the cold courtyard, and as far as I could see, I saw them standing at the gate, waving farewell to me, the brisk winds tossing their white hair. End of chapter 4